All right, good evening. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for those that are joining via the live stream. Thank you for being with us and watching by YouTube. If maybe you're at a later time, thank you for taking time out of your day uh, to uh, join us for our service tonight as we're continuing on in our series, <coughs> excuse me, as we're continuing on our series on worship uh, that we've titled above all things, Worship in Spirit and in Truth. So we're going to be uh, looking at uh, the third message uh, in the series so far tonight. Just really, really excited about that. Uh, but just want to take just a moment. Well, of course, we've got our prayer time after the service, so those that are on the live stream, uh, the private side of the live stream, just hang with us, and uh, we'll come back right, at the end, right after the end of the service. But do want to take just a moment to just praise the Lord, uh, number one, for the seven that joined, uh, number two, uh, for two that got saved. Uh, we actually had uh, uh, Brother French, who visited with us today, really ask that you all pray for him, and we'll be trying to get in touch with him this week and spend a little bit more time with him. Uh, but uh, he came to the altar during the altar call. He came to Christ. Brother Colby took him back and led him to the Lord. And then as I was standing out shaking hands uh, with folks, uh, Sister Robin uh, brought up Braden Camper, and, uh, and uh, he got saved down to Children's Church. Uh, so uh, an adult and a child in the same service. That's not bad at all. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, had the opportunity. Uh, Sister Lisa had sent me a note. She'd been sharing a prayer request. We were going to add him to the prayer list tonight. Uh, a man named Jimmy Phelan up at Bristol Regional Medical. And uh, he wanted to uh, make sure of his salvation. So uh, between church services, we ran up to Bristol uh, and uh, had a chance to talk to him and help him uh, confirm that he truly was saved, that what he had done uh, was the right thing, the right way, and all that kind of stuff. So it's just been a good day. Uh, and, and I'm just excited about all that God's doing. Uh, as far as our announcements go, don't forget the Widows Group meeting on March the 12th, 1 o'clock. Uh, please text or call Sister Geneva if you're planning to attend. Also feel free to invite a widowed friend. Church business meeting, and we said we'd be announcing this today, Wednesday, and Sunday. Uh, but we're going to have a church business meeting on March the 16th at 6.30. That will be a business meeting only service as we're going to be looking at the budget and sharing with you the budget for 2022-2023, uh, April through March, uh, and uh, going over all of that for a vote. Also, we'll be talking to you about <clears throat> at least one missionary. Uh, that we're looking to take on. As we've told you, we've lost a couple in the last couple of, well, last six months, we've lost a couple of missionaries on the field, uh, and we're looking to uh, uh, take others on in their place. So we'll be talking about that uh, in that Wednesday night as well. So please plan on being with us. Uh, that way you can kind of see what we're looking to do from a budget perspective and, and how we're doing it and all those kind of things. God has truly blessed our church. Uh, in 2021, 2022, and we're going to be able to build off of that this year and into next uh, to do some wonderful things. So I'm really just excited about all of that. So please plan on being with us if you can on that Wednesday night. Rummage sale April the 8th and 9th. Sale items can be dropped off starting March 23rd. Also, if you'd like to make a monetary donation uh, for the breakfast and lunch supplies, please uh, give those to Brother Bill Farmer. Uh, Vacation Bible School, July 10th through the 14th. Uh, from 6 to 8.30 p.m. July 2nd is going to be the kickoff. We're hoping to have about seven uh, different race cars here on the, uh, on the property because our theme this year is drive. And we're going to, uh, 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 no, drive, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I drew a blank though for just a second. I'm like, was that right? Um, and uh, anyway, it's going to be drive. Uh, and so really excited uh, about that. Uh, then Operation Christmas Child, brushes, combs, hair bows, and toothbrushes. Um, we've been announcing about the teachers. The spring quarter materials are downstairs. Also, <coughs> still need uh, the last Sunday morning of the next three months for security. So if you haven't signed up for that yet and can, please do so. That's all the announcements I've got. Is there some any that I've forgotten? Don't forget also this Wednesday night, uh, like I said, what we do when folks uh, uh, want to join the church is we kind of introduce those and put everybody before the church on that Sunday. And then we actually vote on that this coming Wednesday night. So we'll take just a few minutes to do that uh, at the beginning of the service this, com <clears throat> this coming Wednesday, all right? Any other announcements that I forgot? 
Any other announcements? Well, then let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right in to our message tonight. Father, we just come to you thanking you. My goodness, what a day it has been. And Father, how we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the touch uh, that you have upon this church. Father, as the folks that make up this body of believers, we should never, ever take for granted when we see you work in our midst. There are so many churches because of COVID and other situations that are closing their doors. Can't keep the doors open because either there's no interest or uh, sickness and things have so drained the finances of the church that they can't even maintain their services. But Father, how we come to you just thankful for the privilege that you've given us to serve you and the blessings that you bestow upon us. Thank you for those that are, have joined. Thank you for those <clears throat> that have gotten saved most of all. And Father, thank you for the privilege and opportunity that we have to minister for you. Now, Father, I pray that you'd be with each of the uh, classes tonight, Rama, as they're going on downstairs, the youth as they're meeting over in the upper room. Father, I pray that you would just bless their time in the Word of God. Again, Father, we had one saved in children's church this morning. If another sees that need of a Savior tonight, Father, I pray that tonight would be the night that they'd come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Father, we pray the same here as well, but just ask that you'd have your way in everything that's said and done, and we'll give you the glory for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter number 4. We're going to do things just a little bit different rather than starting out reading the Scripture. We're going to, we're going to kind of lay the groundwork here, and then we'll read uh, all of Revelation chapter number 4. It's only 11 verses. But in the first message in this series on worship, we presented a biblical definition of worship that carries both the idea of worshiping in spirit and in worshiping in truth. That definition is worship is the expression of my adoration of God. That's part of what it means to worship God in spirit. For who he is and our relationship with him. That's what it means to worship in truth. So worship is the expression of my adoration of God for who he is and our relationship with him. Then in the second message last week, <clears throat> we looked at the essence of worship. As we looked at Mary's breaking of the alabaster box as a sign of her adoration of the Savior. And in looking at what she did during that time, we see that adorations, adoration means that there's thankfulness, that there's priority, that there's sacrifice, that there's devotion, and that there's humility. Now, tonight, we're moving into another important element of worship, and that is that true worship includes wonder. True worship includes wonder. And to start with, I want us to understand that Satan is a master counterfeiter. For instance, in the last days, there will be a counterfeit trinity of Satan and the Antichrist or the beast and the false prophet. Just like there's a trinity of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And I truly believe that we're seeing one of Satan's greatest counterfeits as it relates to the worship of God. And that's in the substitution of wonder for entertainment. Wonder is to be so caught up in God to the point that it impacts our thoughts, our wills, and our emotions. Satan has gradually introduced entertainment into the church today as a means of getting to our emotions while bypassing our thoughts and bypassing our wills. That's why it's what's often called worship in our churches today is an experience for the person attending, while it's not a true expression of adoration for God. But true worship is directed to God, and it has at its core this element or this ingredient of wonder. 
To wonder in Hebrew basically means to distinguish or to separate. It means basically to see God as different than all other things and with that recognition to be awestruck by it. The Greek words that connect, to, connect us to worship are very similar. Amazement and a feeling of being overwhelmed by God, who He is and what He's done for us. That's why in Psalms we read such words as those found in Psalm 107. And if you go back and read Psalm 107, you'll see this phrase over and over and over again throughout that psalm. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. It's why we read words like Paul wrote in Romans 11, starting in verse 33. Oh, the, uh, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been His counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So the question becomes, how do we restore our wonder as we seek to worship God above all, and in spirit, and in truth? And I think we begin to find our answer as we look at some worship services <clears throat> that we see in the book of the Revelation. In these worship services that we're going to be looking at at least tonight and next week, as we look at these worship services, we see God worshiped first as the creator in, Gen in Revelation chapter number 4. Then in chapter number 5, we see him worshiped as the redeemer. Then in chapter number 11, we see him worshipped as the king. And then in chapter number 19, we see him worshipped as the bridegroom. So let's look at the first one that we see here in Revelation 4 as we see this worship of the Creator. Revelation chapter number 4, starting in verse number 1. After this, I looked... And behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had, they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each one of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now notice with me, first of all, that this worship of the Creator focuses on God. As we read this chapter, we see that this focus truly is directed right at Him. 
And the first thing that we see as we open this chapter is the fact that God is sovereign. Because verse number 2 shows him plainly seated upon a throne. As Psalm 115 and verse number 3 says, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. That's the very definition of sovereignty. The power and the authority to do whatever God pleases. But we also see there in verse number 3 that God not only is sovereign, but he's also indescribable. Notice that John says here that the glory of God was so great. He says that all I can do is give you a description of the colors that I was able to behold. Purple and green and red and all the colors of the rainbow. Other than that, John could only wonder at what he saw when he looked upon God seated upon that throne. Then John focuses on the words of the four beasts and they cry out in worship at the holiness of God in verse number 8. And along with that holiness, they lift up God for the fact that not only is He sovereign, but He is the Lord God Almighty. Then we see in the same description that God is eternal. Not only is He the God which was and is and is to come, but He's the God who liveth forever and ever, according to verses 8 and 9. Then in verse 11, we see that He's worthy to receive power and glory and honor. Why? Because He's the Creator of all things, and everything that God created is a direct part and plan in the will of God. So let me ask you, have you ever stopped and thought about God as your creator? Do you stop and meditate on all that it means and all that it would take to be the creator? He truly is sovereign. He truly is indescribable. He truly is holy. He truly is almighty. He truly is eternal. And yes, He is worthy. So worship, in order to get to the wonder of God, or to, to experience the wonder of worship, is to focus on God and to realize all that He is. And here in chapter 4, we just see Him described as the Creator. Can you imagine what's coming when we talk about him being the redeemer and the bridegroom and everything? I'm excited about what's coming. But then we see the expressions of wonder. We see the focus on God. But then we also see as a result of that the, the, the expressions of wonder. When we do take time to think of God as our creator, it should cause wonder to just well up in our hearts Wonder, as I said earlier, is the combination of my thoughts and my emotions and my will working together in concert as I express my adoration of God. And several different responses can be seen throughout Scripture when a person contemplates God as the Creator. Now, go with me in your Bible to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. Now listen to this as worship. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the works of thy finger, and the work, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast 
crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion and uh, 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 have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Notice the words, the shock, I guess, in David's words in this psalm. He says, at first when you read that, it sounds like he's saying, who am I? But that's not it. And, and, and to me, like I said, words matter. Notice what he says. He doesn't say, who is man? But what is man? What am I? When I consider how great you are and all that you created, what am I? I'm made a little lower than the angels, and yet it's my glory and my honor to not only worship you, but to have a relationship with you. As lowly as I am as a man, you've still given me dominion over the earth and the things that you've created here. What am I that you would even consider me in any way? Well, that's getting a hold of who God is. When you can look at God and then look at yourself and go, what am I? And then David ends and starts and ends the psalm with worship by saying, O Lord, O Lord, or O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Have you ever stopped and simply been awestruck by the fact that God not only knows you, but that he even knows the very hairs of your head, according to Matthew 10 and verse 30. Have you ever stopped and contemplated the words of Christ in Matthew 10, 28 through 31? That whole little passage absolutely is one of the greatest things for, that I have ever, one of the greatest passages of Scripture to me ever. Listen, this is Christ speaking. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body, both soul and body in hell. Now here it is. Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. In other words, not one bird falls to the ground and God doesn't know it. But the very hairs, he says, of your head are all numbered. And then here's the verse that just sends me into orbit every time I read it. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. We should be awestruck. We should be overcome with wonder when we consider God as our creator and then realize that he notices us and has so much, pays so much attention that he knows the very hairs, the number of the hairs on our head. That ought to cause us to wonder. But then we also see that where there's wonder, there's also thankfulness. Go with me, if you will, again, 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse 17. 1 Timothy 6. In verse 17. First Timothy 6 and verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. But here it is. But in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. The Bible says in Psalm 50 and verse number 10, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. 
And when we look at the creation and we look at the bounty that's on this earth, we can't help but be struck by the wonderful truth that's found here in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17 that says that God as the Creator has given all of these things, given us richly all of these things for us to enjoy. Here's what we have to understand. Wonder brings thankfulness. But also according to the Scripture, and this is so important, and, and I don't know, years ago God showed me this, and I, I, I've never been able to get it out of my head. Wonder drives thankfulness. But a lack of thankfulness leads to idolatry. Thankfulness is, wonder drives thankfulness, but a lack of thankfulness leads to idolatry. And you say, how in the world do you get that? Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. They lost the wonder and they stopped being thankful. Now listen to what happens. But became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You see what happens? When you lose the wonder and you lose the thankfulness and you stop glorifying God as God, what happens is you start looking around and somehow in, you, in the back of our minds with all of the bounty, things like this start going through our heads. Boy, look at, look at what I did. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? Is not this great Babylon that I have built. Nebuchadnezzar made an idol out of everything that he thought he had done, so God made him think he was an animal for seven years. Wonder brings us or should bring us to thankfulness. But if we lose the wonder, it doesn't take too awfully long before we start looking around and thinking we're the ones who did all of this and look at how good we are, look at how successful we are, look at how awesome we are. And what ends up happening is, is we make an idol of things or of ourselves. So where there's true wonder, there's thankfulness. But then we also see that where there's true wonder, there's faith. Go with me to Philippians chapter number 4. Very familiar passage of Scripture. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now here's the thing, and this is how all of this is connected. The thankfulness that we've talked about also bleeds over into our faith. Why? Because if we're thankful for all that God has given us, it's not that big of a leap to have faith that He's going to continue to meet our needs in the future. Because God is the Creator, we can know that God knows us, and we can know that God knows our needs, and that He will, as a loving Father, meet those needs. 
But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Have you ever stopped and been struck by the wonder that God has covenanted, covenanted with you to meet your needs? He does this out of His great love that He has for us. As it says in Luke chapter number 11, in verses 11 through 13, Christ again speaking, listen, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Isn't it amazing? Jesus says here, you're a sinful man. You're a sinful person. And yet when your child comes to you with a need, you try to meet that need as best you can. And He said, and God the Father is perfect. And because He loves you, do you think He's going to do any less but give you the very thing you truly need? Now, here's the thing. Sometimes the thing we truly need ain't the thing we want. You ever done that with your kids? Or your grandkids or whatever? Oh, I want this. Nope, that's not what they needed. Sometimes, and it's hard, but sometimes they want this, but what they need is the answer no. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes the want is this, but the need is for a no. But here's the thing. Even when God tells us no, isn't it wonderful that it's a good gift from Him? Kind of hard to suck that up sometimes. <laughs> but even when the answer is no, it's a good and perfect gift from God the Father because God is my creator I can know that there is no need that I could ever have that's outside of his ability to supply and that kind of faith ought to fill us with wonder then we also see that wonder means that there's hope go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter number 12 Ecclesiastes chapter number 12. Last chapter of the book. Of course, we know that in Ecclesiastes, especially if you remember when we were doing the video devotions on the book of Ecclesiastes, the Ecclesiastes was Solomon trying to find satisfaction in the things of the world. This was his stage of not so much being thankful as it was just trying to find things that would satisfy his own soul. And over and over again, he kept coming back to the same result. This is all vanity if God's not in it. And here we come to the last chapter of Ecclesiastes, and starting in chapter number 12, we see something else. Now here's the thing. Poor old Solomon, and you, and you read this book, and you understand that Solomon, like I said, he was trying to fill his life with all of these things, and none of them were satisfying him. They were, and, and what he was doing was getting discouraged. What is there? What can I do? How do I fill this void? When you look around the world today, it's easy to get discouraged. War, disease, financial trouble. Well, don't that sound like today? And evil leaders, and even simply trying to provide for your family in trying times, can be enough to bring a person to their breaking point. But the Bible gives us a cure for pessimism and despair in Ecclesiastes chapter number 12, starting in verse number 1. 
Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets, or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Solomon says, man, when things are good, remember your creator and all that he's doing for you. And that way, when things get hard, you'll remember him. And you'll have hope because of what he's done for you in the past. You can know that he'll do what he, you need him to do in the future. Remember, Solomon says, and worship the Creator. When things get dismal and things get dark, the cure is to have hope in the fact that God has a plan and that what He said, He'll do. Not only did He create the world and all that's in it, thank God He created a plan of redemption before He ever spoke the first thing into existence. And if He's going to think of, the, if He's got the plan of redemption laid out before He ever created the first thing, don't you think He knows exactly what you need today? That's hope. And because we know that there's more to our existence than just this life, we can have hope. As a matter of fact, it's the only way that anyone can have hope. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And one day, that hope's going to be realized when we're enjoying the creative work of God yet again in that new heaven and new earth. So there's hope. But then lastly, we see that wonder also means that there's trust. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19. The wonder of the worship, the wonder of the Creator. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 19. One of the greatest things that causes us to stand in wonder is the reality that even when things are not as we want them to be, when we suffer even though we're trying to do what's right, we can trust the plan of God. And more importantly, we can trust Him. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Now, I've told you the story before that when Aaron was little, I was preaching a message on the difference between faith and trust. And faith is what I believe about God. But trust is what I'm willing to do because of what I believe about God. And so I had Aaron come up on the, uh, and he, he had no idea. Uh, you know, and I had him come up on the altar, and he stood there at the top, and I said, Buddy, I said, uh, do you believe if you jumped off that altar, I'd catch you? And he said, yeah. I wouldn't do it now. He'd kill me. But then, he was three. I said, I said, do you believe I'd catch you if you jumped off that altar? He said, yeah. I said, then jump. 
And he jumped. Boy, I was glad I was ready. Because he didn't know what he jumped. And I caught him. Faith was him believing that I would catch him. The jump was the fact that he trusted me. And that's what wonder does. When we look and we see all of the things that we've talked about tonight, when we take a look at all of those things in concert, then what it does is that wonder builds up within us a trust that because of all of this, if he told me to jump off that altar, I'd be willing to do it. Warren Wiersbe said this so well. Finally, when we know and worship the Creator, we can face personal suffering and use it for God's glory. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him and doing good is to a faithful Creator. Not a faithful King or even a faithful Savior, but a faithful Creator. Only a faithful Creator can make all things work together for good. Romans 8, 28. The climax of the book of Job, certainly a book about human suffering, comes when God reveals himself as the creator. When you worship the creator and lose yourself in the wonder of his creation, and he's speaking here of everything that God does for us, it can make a great difference in your personal Christian life. It'll make you willing to jump. As we look at worship of God as the creator, we see two things that bring us to a place of wonder. One, how we get to that place is to simply focus on God. And then when we focus on God as the creator, it, we then express wonder as we stand in awe of him, as we express our thankfulness to him, as we rest in faith, because of his promises, as we live in hope in this present creation, and we look forward to the one that's coming, and as we learn to trust him as we live in this world and look for the one to come. Worship has at its base wonder. So let me ask you a question as Sabrina comes to play softly. When's the last time that you got overwhelmed just thinking about God as your creator, the one who does all things well and who's promised and covenanted to meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory? We stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed to Sabrina plays softly. My Heavenly Father, <laughs> don't do this much on Sunday nights, but you just kind of burdened my heart for it this evening. That we would be caught up in wonder. Father, when we read that description of you sitting on the throne in Revelation chapter number 4, we see your sovereignty. We see your holiness. We see the fact that John was so overwhelmed, he couldn't even describe what he was seeing on the throne. That's where wonder starts. But then that wonder becomes an expression when we take that step back as we look at you as the Creator and we stand in awe of you. And we realize just how thankful that we ought to be. That you would even consider, as David said, what am I? And then, Father, when we get a hold of that, we can have faith because of what you've done. And we can have hope even in the midst of trouble.
ask ourselves the question. Do I wonder at God? Is my worship the result of wonder? And help us, Father, that that would be where we start is with wonder. The best place to start is at the very beginning with you as the creator. How about you tonight? Do you describe your worship of God as being marked by one? Or is it kind of falling into the routine? Yeah, we have kind of you know things that we do in a particular order. That's not what worship is. Worship is your expression of adoration of God for who He is and our relationship with Him. Do you get caught up in wonder? My Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the reminder that worship Somebody else? Somebody else? Somebody else? And don't forget, join us Wednesday night at 6.30 as we'll be beginning a look at uh, those who say that when they've died or something's happened, they visited and, and visited either heaven or hell. We'll be talking about that as far as this series we've been doing. I'm standing on solid ground looking at heresies in the church. So you just prayed God would use me to kind of do whatever he'd have said in this time. All right. All hearts and minds clear. All hearts and minds clear. Father, we love you. Thank you for the day that you've given us. Thank you for the souls that were saved. Thank you for the families and the folks that have joined just looking forward to seeing you do great and mighty things in the days ahead, in those families and in our church as a whole. Watch over us now. Keep us safe, and we'll thank you for all that you do. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen. Now, don't forget, those of you that are on the church, that are part of the church live, the private side of the live stream, we'll be right back uh, with prayer time. So you just hang around. We'll be coming right back. All right. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Yeah, I heard that Mike die right there at the end of the service. It's what happens when you don't pay attention to the batteries.